Hello and welcome to today's Bible reading and devotional time, day 37 of our 102 days reading through Luke and Acts. It's Monday. Oh, wait a minute. It's Labor Day. It's a holiday for many of us. You got a job and so now we're going to give you a day off to celebrate it. Wait, what? Anyway, uh, Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 19 is where we are today. Hit that subscribe bar and then the notification bell when it comes up so you can be notified whenever content's added to the channel. Comment on these videos, like these videos, share these videos, yay, yay, you know the drill. And so we are in Luke chapter 16 today for our reading, starting in chapter 16 in verse 9. This is a uh, familiar uh section of scripture for for uh, for us all i think and uh, luke uh, in his gospel he's highlighting uh, some reversals here uh, and, you're, uh, and you'll see what i mean here in just a second he did it back in chapter one and then chapter four and chapter six uh, and this is going to be dealing with the rich man and lazarus a rich man and a poor man uh, how their fortunes were on in this life versus how their fortunes were in the next life and abraham's uh father abraham's reply to the rich man and about things that were going on there so let's let's read our text first here in verse 19 that there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day but there was a certain beggar named lazarus full of sores who was who uh, was laid at his gate desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And so it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, and Lazarus evil, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded by one who rise uh, from the dead. Now, these are some artist rendition of what this looks like, the situation with the rich man and Lazarus. Now, this, is, is, this painting is called Lazarus and Dives. It's an illumination from the 11th century Codex Aurarius of Ectronaut. And I'm not real sure. I've never heard of that particular codex before, so I don't know that much about it. But up here on the top is you have the uh the lazarus at the rich man's door here's lazarus here on the right and then over here is uh the uh the rich man and you can see he's dining got a fancy table there tablecloth the whole bit and then here's lazarus's soul being carried to paradise and uh uh by by angels and he's in abraham's bosom and then here's the rich man's soul being carried off by Satan to Hades or to hell, and where he's going to be tortured uh, and get his just reward, essentially, for what he did uh, in his life. And here's another uh, rendition. Uh, here, uh, This is just Lazarus down here at the, at the on the steps to the rich man's house. He kind of has a pharaoh look there, I thought the rich man did. This is uh, an illustration by Gustave Doré. The rich man and Lazarus, he was a French painter from 1832 to 1883 was his lifespan. And, and then there's a couple of others here. Here's Lazarus lying on the steps again. It looks like, you know, this is a 
monstrosity just by the way these steps look laid out here's a dog that's tearing at his clothes and probably you know, no doubt licking his wounds like the text says now now the big question about uh this uh story that jesus tells is it history or is it a parable did it really happen or is it something he made up to teach a point to you know to make a, a spiritual point and uh there's considerable debate about that. This is the top uh, frame from that Lazarus and Dives from the 11th century Codex Arius of Ecternot that I showed. And Dives was a Latin name for, I think, wealthy or rich. And because uh, the man is not named, there's some manuscripts, some Latin manuscripts that call him Dives or uses the, the uh, Latin terms for wealthy. But is this real? Because Lazarus was a common name. Uh, I didn't realize this until I was studying for this, but Eliezer is the Greek form of Lazarus, and it means he whom God has helped. And this is the only instance, though, it, it, where Jesus uses a personal name when he uh, you, uh, does an illustration like this. And you can tell that uh, the one who's helped by God here would be, in the end, is Lazarus, because Lazarus goes to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man ends up, well, let's just say he needs permanent air conditioning, which he's probably not going to get. So is this parable or is this history? Well, there's some arguments in favor of being a parable. You look at the introduction. This is the way parables typically begin, or one of the ways. You know, a certain rich man. A certain man had two sons. Uh, a certain king. A certain somebody did something. And so that's an indicator that it's a parable. Also... There's nothing in Scripture about who's about Abraham presiding over paradise. Now, the word paradise uh, is not used, at least not in the English translation. But this was Kaufman's point that uh, this is because it says Abraham's uh, is presiding. Uh, let me rephrase that: because Abraham seems to be presiding there, he's the one that's calling the shots. It looks like there's nothing else in Scripture. God is the one presiding over paradise, uh, over heaven. But it doesn't say that it's heaven. It just says it's Abraham's bosom. Exactly what that is, it might be a holding area uh, between here and heaven. You know, we don't know really what it is, uh, as far as I know. And then, is it history? Well, there is the personal name Lazarus. And Jesus never used a personal name in any of his other parables. So that argument, that was Walter Martin's argument, was that the personal name uh, showed it to be uh, actual real people and real happenings. And then Jesus himself did not explicitly say that it was a parable. And, and that's kind of a weak one there, but uh, because there are other places where he just started telling a parable, a certain man did whatever. Me personally, I don't think it really matters as long as we get what the teaching is. I, I do personally lean towards this being a real event with real people and not a parable. But if you think it's a parable, that's fine. That's okay. Yeah, but let's look beyond parable or real. Let's see what's, what's the point of this. What does Jesus want us to get from this? And here's some truths here. And you notice the difference. I said there's, there's some differences. There's a reversal here because the rich man is doing really well in this life. He's wealthy. He has plenty to eat. Lazarus is poor, destitute, has nothing. And then when they die, that switches, that flip-flops. The rich man's got nothing except torment, and Lazarus is comforted. And here we see, uh, this is from uh, the uh, Leadership Ministries Worldwide, the Preacher and uh, Outline and Sermon Bible, the difference in their lives, the difference in their death. The, uh, Lazarus died, he's escorted to paradise. Says the angels carried him. The rich man died and was buried. And then the difference is in their eternal destination. Where are they spending eternity? That is a big difference. And then another big difference, and here you can see this is, I believe, the uh, Abraham figure over here. And here is, uh, I'm, ge I'm, I'm guessing that's the rich man, the kind of purple there uh, around the, his head. And the purple, by the way, is symbolic of royalty, somebody who is really wealthy, uh, who is really at the top of society. But um, a big difference between Lazarus and the rich man, I hadn't thought of that until I was getting ready for today's installment is the rich man is nameless Lazarus we know his name and the difference there as this writer pointed out is that uh, in one case Lazarus was known and honored by God 
and then in the other the rich man is not known and honored by god remember jesus said on the judgment i will say to them i never knew you depart from me you workers of iniquity and so the rich man did not know god himself therefore he's unknown to god and god is not going to honor him god is not going to bring him uh into paradise he is nameless before god lazarus knew god God knew Lazarus, so Lazarus is now with God for eternity. And remember, the name is God is my uh, uh, helper, or one who helps God, or helped by God. So now going back to our text here, in uh, beginning in chapter 17, when he said to the or then he said to the disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourself. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you and saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And notice that word shall. I'll come back to that. Verse 5, And the apostle said to the Lord, Increase our faith. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted by the sea, and it would obey you. And which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat? But he will not, uh, but will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me until I have eaten and drunk, and afterwards you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. So this is what one writer called a travel narrative. It's not real clear how this relates to the section that's preceding it. Uh, it doesn't look to me like there really is a connection. Uh, it's just some time after Jesus told about the rich man and Lazarus, and now he's giving his disciples some more words of wisdom, discussing how believers are to treat one another, and then he's talking about real faith, and then the best uh, of God's servants are still going to be unworthy because we just do our job. We just There's nothing special about doing your job, although politeness would say when the waiter at, to brings you your coffee or your meal, you always say, thank you. Nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, he's not going to be expecting you to jump up on the table and make a really loud, hey, I want to thank uh, uh, Billy over here for bringing my steak out to me or bringing my, my coffee or my Coke or whatever you're drinking. Well, you know, thank you. You did your job. I appreciate it. And, you know, that sort of thing. And Jesus here is alternating once again between speaking in crowds or speaking to crowds and then speaking and teaching to his disciples. And this looks like it's him and the disciples now uh, as he is uh, teaching them here at the beginning of Luke chapter uh, 17. Now look at this idea of rebuking believers. Now I want to pop back over here to our text just for a second and go down here where he says, uh, if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times in a day returns saying, I repent. Notice he says, you shall forgive him. He didn't say you can forgive him or, yeah, you know, it's a good idea. You shall forgive him. That's an order. That's imperative. That is not Jesus just uh, making a suggestion and trying to get you to play nice together. No, he wants you to genuinely uh, forgive the offending brother. And some people are going to be very easily offended. There are people, I believe, especially in this hypersensitive time where we live, and when they roll out of bed in the morning, they're just looking for reasons to be offended. They're going to go to Walmart and hope somebody says something or does something to offend them. Uh, I had a, this happened about a year or so ago. I was at Walmart, and there was a kid that was crying, and I, and I didn't really know why or anything. And his mom, and he was in the shopping cart, and there was another one walking behind her trying to keep up. She came around the corner, and it just so happened, incidental contact. I had just happened to make eye contact with the kid and then with mom just as they're going by. And she just looked at me, glared, and said, he's autistic. Quit staring at him. And I he wasn't staring at him. We just made eye, uh, the incidental eye contact as he went on by. 
hey, I get it. I've worked with autistic uh, people. I have worked with uh, kids, especially uh, ESE that used to be called special ed. That's exceptional student education. Uh, and I've worked with some of those kids and I know they can be uh, difficult to handle and you can get into situations where things like that happen. She probably was just stressed and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but some people are looking for offense. Maybe she was just stressed. I don't know. But here's the thing. If someone does offend and they come back and ask forgiveness, Jesus says to forgive. And if we have to rebuke somebody, uh, remember to pray for God's help. If you've got a brother or sister you need to go to, and remember, uh, Matthew uh, uh, 16 lays it out, uh, that you go in and you. this is how you handle it. Uh, especially, and, and there are no exceptions, okay? I have known uh, in 30 years of ministry, I've known some preachers that have uh, had churches just come and, and let them go and fire them. Why? Well, and they, they're vague about it, but it turns out there were some problems. Sometimes they were legitimate, but they should have gone to the preacher and said, okay, we've got these concerns. Let's see if we can work it out. Uh, and it's happened to me too. Uh, but this is for Christians. It, there's no exceptions. Your preacher, your elders, your deacons, they are human. And if you got a beef with them or a problem, here's how you're supposed to handle it. First, pray about it. Pray for God's help get, so you can get your concern across without antagonizing. You don't need to go in guns blazing, uh, angry. Okay, settle down, pray about it, and go in and be calm. The other person, very good likelihood they, they're not even going to know that you're offended or that you're upset about something. And then approach them as a friend. Don't approach them as an adversary. Don't approach them as an enemy. Don't approach this as the preacher. I've got to get him run off. He needs to be fired. He needs to be run out of here. Or you've already got an attitude problem. Unless there is some real gross malfeasance in office, like he's been caught embezzling money, uh, abusing uh, people, that's different. But if you just didn't like what he said in his Sunday sermon, you, you need to approach this properly. And then imagine the most innocent possible reason. Give them the benefit of the doubt when you go to see somebody. Maybe you just misunderstood what was said. Maybe you misunderstood the intentions. Uh, you know, cool. Be cool about it, okay? And then make your approach a, a, a gradual mutual agreement. Hey, can I talk to you for a minute? And uh, I need to ask you something. You know, you said such and such, or you did such and such. I wanted to talk to you about it. And this may require an appointment. Hey, can I come by tomorrow and talk to you? Or call them up. Hey, you busy? I'd like to stop by and talk to you. Don't grab them right after services and say, here, come here, I need to talk to you. And you said this in your sermon. You did that. Remember, after the morning services, everybody's hungry. Everybody wants to get out to Cracker Barrel or to Bob Evans or wherever they go for lunch. They want to get down to the fellowship hall for the potluck. Okay, you just blindsided them and it's probably very good likelihood it's not going to go real well at that point. And then state your case uh, clearly. Don't keep bringing up the same thing. You know, here's, you know, you said, told this joke, you said such and such, you did. And I just want you to know, I was bothered by it. I, I felt like that was offensive uh, or that was uh, uh, inappropriate, whatever the, the feelings are. And then express gratitude that they uh, took the time to talk to you. Exp you know, give confidence of whatever friendship, whatever relationship you have. Show that you have no doubt it's been resolved. Don't come back later and not talk to them for six months because of what was said. I had a friend once who uh, went down uh, when a, a, a mutual friend of ours was, was moving. And uh, he went down to go to church with him and maybe have lunch. Well, unexpectedly, uh, the friend of ours, uh, the friend number number three, uh, number two, we'll say, I'm number, uh, the friend number two, got called into work at the last minute. And he had a, a job with security clearance. It wasn't in the military, but it was kind of an important job. Well, friend number one goes down there. And gets all upset because friend number two didn't tell me that he had to work. Well, he didn't think about it. It was kind of a last minute deal. For the next two years, whenever friend number two was mentioned, all I ever heard was, yeah, he still owes me an explanation. Finally, I had to say, dude, let it go. He's moved on. I've moved on. Everybody's moved on except you. You need to just drop it. He got called into work. And in his particular line of work, 
There wasn't much he could do about it. And then Jesus talks about the faith of a mustard seed. This is a conditional statement. If you have the faith of a mustard seed, and they are tiny, and they're one of the smallest, if not the smallest seed. So with the smallest of faith, we can do things. He's not literally talking about a tree uprooting and going and planting by the sea. Mulberry trees, I think, have pretty deep roots. I'm not real sure. Our Lord Jesus also said, you can, with the faith of a mustard seed, tell this mountain, remove and jump into the sea. Okay, not literally. He's talking, and this is where you got to use your head and use hermeneutics uh, and principles of interpretation. What he's talking about is with just a little faith, you can do great things. There's much you can do with just the tiniest amount of faith. That's his point. And if you're not, if you're going to discount miracles and discount uh, anything uh, extra special that Jesus or any of the Bible characters did, then you don't have faith. That that's you know, the more I'm thinking about it here and processing it. The progressive Christians they don't have faith. They have zero faith in God because they reject all these things, uh, which is why I call them pointless Christians. Uh, because their their Christianity or lack of it is just pointless. Anyway, you can see some of my other videos about that, and I'll probably be making some more in the future. But that is going to wrap it up for today. And for Monday, we're going to pray for our families, our immediate and extended families, for physical and spiritual well-being. So we thank you, Lord, again for another day and giving us another week. And for those who have the day off, help us to spend the time wisely, and with our families and and doing things with them we want to pray lord for our families uh, who aren't christians that you'll uh, help them to open their minds and hearts to the gospel to the truth of it we pray for the physical needs uh, i just talked to my aunt uh, the other day has got COVID. i want to lift her up to you and pray for her the, the healing and pray for my other aunt who's still alive and that her health can be good we just pray lord that you'll help us to encourage our families for the, those who are spiritually struggling, we just pray we can encourage them to find their peace with you and truth with you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins we have through him. In Jesus' name, amen. So leave your comments in the comment section below. If uh, uh, you have any questions, you can leave them there in the comment section or send them to me at 2timothy4.2.3 at gmail.com. I'll be glad to answer them. I uh, can do it in a sermon. It'll be my discretion how I decide to answer it, but that's going to wrap it up for now. We'll see you in the next video. I'm done, and I'm me and the USS Lexington. Hey, we're going to have some have some coffee right now. We'll see you in the next video.